Welcome everybody to uh, the beginning of uh, Great Decisions 2022. I'll be your host, Jeffrey Crean, and I will present uh, next uh, week as well uh, on my own uh, and introduce the other presenters the other week, including this week. So this week we have uh, Stephen Stein, who will be presenting on industrial policy. Uh, before we get going, uh, I would like to say that, uh, first of all, these talks will be held uh, every Wednesday at noon between today and uh, early March. Uh, so uh, uh, you, there'll be, a, you know, hopefully I will see all of you back, many of you back here uh, in subsequent weeks. Uh, the Great Decisions Lecture Series is sponsored by the following organizations. The American Association of University Women of Tyler, an organization dedicated to the advancement of gender equity for women and girls through research, education, and advocacy. The League of Women Voters of Tyler Smith County, a nonpartisan voter education and advocacy organization whose mission is to educate, register, and ultimately get citizens of Smith County to the polls, educated and prepared to make informed decisions. The Tyler Public Library, where we are, of course, right now, and the National Foreign Policy Association, who comes up with these topics each year, from which, as it says, the topics are chosen for discussion groups like ours all over the US. The Smith County Discussion Group has been ongoing for over 30 years. Uh, and with that, I will introduce our first speaker, Stephen Stein, who, like me, uh, teaches at, is a full-time professor at Tyler Junior College. Well, I have only been here since uh, January 2020. He has been teaching here since 1998, teaching history, government, and economics. From 1995 until 1998, he was an instructor of history at the University of Memphis. From 1973 to 1995, Professor Stein worked as a bank examiner and liquidator for the federal government and multi-state bank holding companies in Texas, Tennessee, New York, and Puerto Rico. Uh, Professor Stein holds a bachelor's degree in economics with honors from Texas Tech University and graduate degrees in history and finance from the University of Memphis and Rutgers University. He has completed graduate programs in political science, economics, Spanish literature, and theology from Texas Tech University, New York University, University of Texas at Tyler, University of Texas at El Paso, and the University of the South in Suwannee, Florida. Uh, Professor Stein was ordained in 1986 as a permanent vocational deacon in the Episcopal Church and has served in Texas, New Mexico, Tennessee, and Mexico. From since 1998, he has served as the deacon on the clergy staff of the Christ, Christ Episcopal Church here in Tyler. His wife, Lori M. Dow, is a retired uh, prosthetist, pr prosthetist, and his son, Daniel, uh, is the Deputy Director of the Office of Environmental Health and Safety at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, Professor Stein uh, present uh, remotely uh, last year in 2021, where he presented on uh, supply chains and uh, national security, and uh, t now he is presenting on industrial policy. So he is our go-to guy on all things economics. Uh, <laughs> so with that, I introduce to you Stephen Stein. Stephen, you have the floor, and we will talk, and afterwards there will be question and answer period. Thank you, Dr. Crean. It's good to have everybody here. It's nice being able to be <clears throat> somewhat in, in uh, personal uh, distance, uh, much better than uh, lecturing over the uh, airwaves as we had to do last year during uh, Snowmageddon uh, and during the uh, first wave of the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, as uh, Dr. Crean uh, mentioned, I have uh, uh, graduate uh, degrees uh, in and have taught uh, government and economics. So uh, I know like Alexander Pope's uh, imprecation uh, that uh, little knowledge is a dangerous thing. I know enough about government and economics to get myself in trouble on uh, most, uh, uh, most any uh, topic. But I'll try to stay away from an extended lecture on the tariff system of the, of the world, which uh, I have used many times to bore my classes uh, to, uh, to death. I've always told them if you want to uh, be sure to I have something to put you to sleep, record my lecture on tariff policy, and you'll go out uh, immediately if, uh, when, you, when you get in bed. I want to make two plugs, uh, three plugs actually. One, Tyler Public Library. The library system in our uh, nation is one of the fundamental parts of our democratic uh, experience. Uh, we should encourage it. We should support the uh, Tyler Public Library. My wife and I are members of the Library Association. I urge you to uh, join it and to 
participate in the activities. Uh, second plug is for the League of Women Voters of the United States. My wife Lori and I are also members of the Tyler chapter of the League of Women Voters. Uh, another fundamental uh, part of American uh, democratic experience. And the third is the American Association of University Women. My mother, Catherine <clears throat> Stein, excuse me, was a member of the AAUW from uh, as early as I can remember, uh, three, four, five years of age. There was never a question in our household about going to college. That was a given. And because my parents have both fortunately gotten graduate degrees, uh, mostly thanks to the GI Bill, it was always a question of where you might go, but there was never gonna be a question about whether you would go to college. And that's a product of the work of the AAUW, especially now as the uh, AAUW works toward uh, greater involvement of women in college. Uh, incidentally, the majority of uh, women and the majority of students in colleges now, particularly in community colleges, is uh, female. So I want to talk today about a uh, very broad uh, subject, uh, industrial policy. And I want to deal with uh, three questions uh, today, and then when I uh, finish, we'll uh, take questions uh, about this uh, area. The first question is, what is industrial policy? The second question is, does the United States have an industrial policy? And the third question is, what is the future of industrial policy? First question, what is industrial policy? Industrial policy covers a very broad range of economic, financial, political, even social, and at times religious uh, issues. Uh, every major uh, civilized um, uh, nation or civilized culture uh, since the time of the Sumerians has, some, has had some type of either de facto, that is actual or de jure, that is by law, uh, industrial uh, policy. Uh, for instance, uh, historians of the Roman Empire have uh, recently uh, raised the question of why didn't the Roman Empire uh, engage in industrial policy and industrialize uh, because the Romans were very bright people. They knew the, they had steam, prototype steam engines. They knew the, how steam engines could have been created, how they could have been used in mining operations uh, to fuel, uh, to uh, power uh, uh, boats. There were, steam could have been applied far earlier than it was. Why didn't they do that? And the general response, general answer is, they had such uh, extensive slave power, they didn't need it. They didn't need to use the innovation, they didn't need to invest capital in anything else. They would just keep capital in the uh, slave power. And this would eventually, of course, uh, change and would cha radically change. So we've had some type of industrial policy uh, for uh, decades, uh, for, for, uh, for millennia, really. Uh, in uh, the more recent times, since the 1500s, 1600s, we've had competition in terms of industrial policy between two major ideas. One is mercantilism and neo-mercantilism and free trade. The idea of mercantilism is that government has a direct involvement uh, very close involvement with uh, industrial policy. Government sets out who manufactures what, who can transport what, uh, how taxes are collected on, on what uh, uh, income streams or is taxation uh, set. And uh, there is, this is directed from, uh, often from a central uh, planning uh, agency. The other idea is free trade, which means that 
you have a system in which uh, the economic forces, uh, uh, particularly what uh, Adam Smith, the creator of a, a capitalistic, um, uh, capitalistic uh, economics, uh, called the unseen hand, the hidden hand. Uh, market forces uh, should be the primary way in which uh, you bring about uh, economic growth, particularly in manufacturing. Uh, though industrial policy is not just limited to manufacturing, it can cover all kinds of areas of so uh, education, financial uh, services, educational services, financial services, social services can all be affected by this broad area of industrial policy. Now we've had through the centuries many types of industrial uh, policy, uh, some more uh, successful uh, than others. Uh, in uh, the USSR, the late unlamented USSR, uh, there was a great central uh, planning. Uh, economists still argue over how successful that was. Uh, it was successful enough to uh, bring uh, the Soviet Union into the uh, League of Major Industrial Powers. Uh, however, uh, even before the Soviet Union uh, was created in 1917, the old czarist system had actually created the fastest growing economy in Europe. So many economic, economic historians say all the uh, Soviets had to do was just let the existing system go and they would have been much better off. Of course, they chose to follow a very centralized system in line with Marxist uh, economic theory. And under that th theory, all the means of production uh, were owned by the state. The state uh, dictated prices, the state dictated quotas, uh, the state uh, dictated requirements uh, for employment. Uh, this uh, was uh, somewhat successful in that uh, the Soviet Union was, through, through this kind of industrial policy, was able to challenge the uh, United States in uh, space and initially uh, to dominate uh, the, space, the space race. Uh, the old joke is that uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, though, was that, uh, the, uh, that the economic policy of the Soviet Union uh, was great at doing everything except providing breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, the, uh, uh, According to a number of accounts of uh, uh, travelers from the West, despite the fact that this was illegal, uh, people from the West uh, and even from other uh, satellite nations of the uh, Soviet Union would travel to the Soviet Union with uh, suitcases filled with uh, Western uh, style toilet paper. And they would finance their trips by selling this toilet paper to the people in, uh, that they encountered in uh, Moscow or uh, Leningrad or Kiev. And that is because Soviet toilet paper had the consistency of, well, let's say, sandpaper. So it was a great system for creating very heavy duty uh, mechanism of uh, machinery uh, for dealing with uh, scient big scientific projects uh, like the space race, but it was a, a, an abysmal failure in terms of providing uh, consumer goods. And much of that had to do with the fact that there were quotas. And so you could meet your, as long as you met your quota, it did not make any difference how shoddy the system was. Uh, a more, another type of industrial policy, um, somewhat more successful, uh, was that of uh, National Socialist Germany, Nazi Germany. Uh, Germany uh, was seeking to create an autarkic system, that is a self-sustaining system. And uh, Germany was fairly successful in doing that under uh, the Hitler regime from 1933 to 1945. There was no state ownership of the means of production as under uh, the communist system. But there was a very clear industrial policy in which the uh, government uh, agencies 
told uh, industry, here is what you will produce, and here is what we will guarantee as your profits. And industry was glad to go along with this. The fact they had to give up uh, personal freedoms and democratic process was incidental because they were all making very good, uh, making very high profits. So this, uh, this approach uh, allowed, the, so allowed uh, Germany uh, to prosecute uh, a near uh, total war uh, in, uh, in their effort to dominate only, not only Europe, but the entire uh, world, uh, world system. Now, in the United States, and let's uh, move to my second question, does the United States have, or have we had, an industrial uh, policy? The answer is yes and no. Remember, I have studied economics, and uh, to I re remind you of what President Harry Truman said, that he wanted to work with a one-handed economist because every economist he ever met said, well, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, <laughs> Uh, yes and no. Uh, until we, we had attempts at creating formal industrial policy uh, as early as 1790 uh, under the uh, federal system and in our uh, system independent as an independent nation. Uh, the United States uh, had been, been part of the mercantilist system of uh, Great Britain of the British Empire for decades, and the United States wanted to get away uh, from that very highly stringent um, uh, system of uh, controlling uh, uh, economic, economic flow. However, in 1790, Alexander Hamilton, the first and one of the greatest, two or three greatest uh, secretaries of the Treasury, uh, issued a report to Congress called the Report on Manufactures. And in it he called for a system of tariffs, that is taxes on imported goods, in order to uh, promote and protect infant industries, industries in the United States. Now Congress did not approve the uh, report and the tariff system was not uh, adopted at that time. However, Hamilton's ideas, and Hamilton, of course, died in 1804, Hamilton's ideas were gradually adopted as America became less of an agricultural nation as it had been in 1790. In 1790, 95% of all the people in the United States worked either directly in agriculture or connected to agriculture. As we move from being an agricultural nation to an industrialized nation starting in the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s, the idea of terrorists became very uh, appealing, particularly for the regions of the country, New England, the Northeast, and the Old Northwest, uh, the Ohio River Valley, the Great Lakes region, where industrialization was taking off. The South hated terrorists. The South dis despised terrorists. And it was one of the reasons that contributed to the uh, sectional uh, differences that would uh, lead to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the Civil War. Uh, and uh, these, uh, but, af but as a consequence of the Civil War and the triumph of the Union, high tariff policy, uh, direct government involvement in the uh, process of uh, uh, encouraging manufacturing and encouraging industrial uh, expansion uh, came into being. And uh, during the Civil War and in the post-Civil War years, tariffs uh, remained uh, very high and they would, uh, they would uh, continue uh, to be very high until uh, the uh, tariffs of uh, 1931, uh, uh, the uh, Smoot-Hawley tariffs. After that, tariffs began to decline and our industrial policy uh, began uh, to change. And tariffs have gradually been reduced uh, until now uh, tariffs are at the lowest rate in, in terms of formal taxes, identifiable taxes on uh, goods and services uh, that uh, the United States uh, imposes. They're, we're at the lowest 
lowest level in, in history. And, and general world tariff levels are the lowest they've been, uh, certainly in the period of the Industrial Age, uh, since the uh, uh, dating the Industrial Age uh, back to the late uh, 1700s. Uh, so the, the United States has had at different times formal industrial policy. We attempted it in the early days of the New Deal with the uh, National Recovery Administration. Uh, it um, died because of the uh, Supreme Court decision uh, ruling it unconstitutional, but it died an unlamented death because it was a very cumbersome uh, system. However, in 1946, uh, Congress passed and President Truman signed the full em the Employment Act of 1946, and it did among among other things. It created the Council of Economic Advisors, all of whom I might add have all had two hands, unlike uh, what President Truman wanted. I had also said that the policy of the United States government would be to work toward full employment. And that's been our official policy since then. The whole period of, uh, and this was directly as a consequence of the devastating, of the uh, uh, turmoil, the great economic turmoil and changes that were uh, created by the Great Depression and uh, our involvement in World War II. So in a sense, we have an official industrial policy. Uh, but the way that that uh, industrial policy has been carried out over uh, the last, uh, since 1946, uh, has uh, varied. We've had uh, administrations which were very interested in formal industrial policy, uh, such as uh, uh, under in President Carter's administration. We have had other administrations like the Reagan administration, which did not want a formal industrial policy. Uh, we've had in uh, the last uh, 20 years, we've had more uh, formal industrial uh, policy, more uh, uh, de jour uh, in industrial policy. But we've had, in effect, we've, we've had a de facto, an in fact uh, system based on, uh, primarily on uh, tax policy and also on subsidies, tax policy and subsidies. Uh, and also, and, and thirdly, our uh, relationship with other, with other nations. Tariffs are very low. Tariffs are very low. However, we have found <laughs> the ingenuity of the human mind is a mar remarkable thing. Uh, we have found through the years, government leaders have found through the years, a number of, way, a number of ways in which to in effect control markets uh, to at least uh, officially maintain uh, that we are a free trade nation uh, without having to go through the formal tariffs. Uh, and this comes through a whole raft of uh, measures, such as licensing requirements, anti-dumping uh, requirements, uh, political and economic sanctions when uh, they're considered uh, appropriate, uh, uh, enforcement of uh, property rights, uh, intellectual property rights, uh, trade agreements, bilateral trade agreements, multilateral trade agreements. Uh, the United States is, was really in the forefront through the Bretton Woods Agreement in uh, 1944 and then with the creation after World War uh, II of the World Trade Organization in creating a system in which we have a much more integrated, uh, uh, more closely tied uh, economic system. The thinking is that uh, nations that trade with each other uh, will not uh, go to war. And that is uh, certainly a, a very estimable uh, idea. However, let me point out that history doesn't necessarily agree with that. In 1914, Germany and Russia uh, were the strongest trading partners with each other. And yet they went to war and then spent uh, the next four years trying to obliterate each other. So world trade does not necessarily lead uh, to, uh, uh, does not necessarily lead to 
uh, political uh, stability. You can just look at the example of the United States and the People's Republic of China. We're strong trading partners, uh, but uh, we certainly have a number of competing uh, political and economic uh, interest. And uh, there is the, the possible threat of, of war as a consequence. So we have had uh, varying degrees of uh, industrial policy, but we have always had, simply because industrial, you have to have some type of industrial policy, whether you call it that or not, uh, in order uh, to maintain a modern uh, economic system. Now, some countries have very formal, uh, very clearly identifiable uh, foreign uh, uh, industrial policies. Uh, Germany, for instance, has a highly integrated uh, system of government, of labor, of uh, business. Uh, government, uh, it is a requirement under uh, German law uh, since World War II uh, under the Federal Republic of Germany that the board of directors of all major corporations have to have representatives of the major uh, labor unions uh, in that uh, particular industry or in that company. Uh, there is a very strong uh, guidance uh, from uh, the uh, ministries of uh, finance and economics in the German uh, system uh, over uh, what is, uh, uh, what will be uh, manufactured. Uh, we have had uh, other countries uh, like the um, uh, so-called uh, Asian Tigers, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, Republic of Korea, uh, Hong Kong, at least until uh, the communists take over. People's Republic of China take over in 1997, have also had very strong uh, uh, policies, uh, industrial policies. One area that the, where these industrial policies have been uh, very clear is in terms of education. Uh, France, for instance. In France, education from kindergarten or pre-kindergarten through graduate school is fully paid for by the French government. Fully paid for. You want to get a doctorate in economics, and you're good enough. Uh, you can you you can do, uh, get it uh, through the French system. The problem is, if you've been in that uh, job at that work for 20 or 30 years, and you decide you want to do something else, yes, you can take a new job. You can go into some other field. Excuse <clears throat> me but you will be taxed so that you'll pr you probably wish you had stayed wherever you had been. So this is, uh, this is one of the d d defects of industrial policy. The great criticism of industrial policy is always government interference that can lead to beneficial effects, but it can also lead to enormous waste, and it can also lead to shoddy uh, manufacturing and to poor uh, economic to, to a lack of um, economic uh, development. So the United States remains the world's leading economy. The People's Republic of China is catching up very quickly, except that there are signs that uh, the People's Republic of China is still uh, looking at a period of, um, of, of possibly slow growth. And that is because in the United States today, remember 1790, 95% of all the American people were directly involved or indirectly involved in agriculture. Today, it's about one and a half to 2% of our population. We have a big agricultural sector. Uh, even in Texas, we, Texas has the second largest uh, in, in terms of states. We're second only to California in agricultural production. But in turn, but we have a very capital intensive uh, system now. Uh, China still has a very labor intensive system. So you have still millions and millions of, uh, hundreds of millions of Chinese, about, uh, about five twelfths or so of the population of uh, mainland China, who are still involved in agriculture. And the question is, can they be transitioned uh, to a new, uh, into an industrial uh, system? 
the the history of doing that kind of rapid industrialization has not been uh, has, has, has often been very bloody. The Soviet Union is a perfect example of this. Uh, China uh, has been a perfect example of this. The Great Leap Forward in the 1950s uh, was. Um, resulted in dislocations and deaths of millions of people. Uh, the five-year plans in the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 1930s uh, had disastrous effects. They did ultimately achieve at least some of the goals of uh, creating increased uh, gross domestic product. However, uh, they came at a very, very high, a very high price. So uh, what we're looking at now is a, a, a system in which you can have uh, industrial policy which is not uh, so drastic and not so draconian uh, that it uh, inhibits uh, what we think of as uh, uh, long cherished or long uh, established uh, ideals. Uh, and uh, ideas of particular freedom. So let's go to the third question. What is the future for uh, industrial policy? Uh, some countries, uh, it, the, the main question that I, the main uh, point I wanna make here is that one industrial policy does not fit all. One industrial policy does not fit all. The Republic of Korea has been very, the South Korea, uh, the good Koreans, the ones who don't want to blow us up, uh, the, uh, has, been, uh, has had a very successful uh, industrial policy. But it has uh, required, again, a very strictly maintained uh, educational system. Uh, they, uh, the Republic of Korea will send you anywhere to study anything as long as, like in the French system, you come back and you work in that field until uh, in that field until you until you retire. Uh, the uh, Korean, the South Korean economy is uh, very strong. It's uh, uh, in the top 15 uh, economies. However, uh, it has it is a not anywhere near as diversified an economy as the United States has, and. The rapid industrialization of South Korea has resulted in terrific environmental problems. Uh, the, over Seoul, the, uh, the primate city of uh, South Korea, uh, there's generally, uh, the pandemics help with this, but generally uh, there's a uh, thick layer of smog over the city. So this is, uh, how do you, because they're still very dependent on uh, coal. So the question is, uh, how can you create a system uh, which is adaptable uh, which, which fits with your country, which uh, is not environmentally damaging, which does allow for uh, greater personal uh, freedoms, uh, and uh, which um, uh, involves a, at least increased levels of uh, uh, cooperation. Now, other, uh, the United States uh, has a very diversified economy. We also have the most diversified uh, population in, in the world. We have the greatest uh, uh, distribution of uh, racial and ethnic groups of any major nation. We have the greatest distribution of, uh, of religious uh, groups. Uh, increasingly, that's uh, people who identify as having no religion, but that's another matter. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, what would work in a country like even France or Germany would not necessarily work uh, in the uh, United States. I'm, all, I'm not advocating for the <laughs> what's often been called the British system of muddling through. Just leave it alone and eventually it'll work its way out. You, know, you could make a good, uh, good uh, argument that that has worked in many cases for the British, but Americans are much more of a can-do kind of people, and we don't like to see things uh, uh, sit around for some extended uh, period of time, especially if it appears to be a festering problem. So, what is our future industrial policy going to mean? First of all, I think it will mean 
moving away from the idea that industrial policy pl applies only uh, is, is all about manufacturing. Industrial policy in a highly diversified economy like ours can mean uh, not just manufacturing, but it can also mean a broad range of services. It can mean a broad uh, range of, um, uh, of ways of, uh, of, of new uh, products, of new, new technologies. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, during this uh, brief, uh, fairly uh, fairly uh, strong cold spell that we've been in in Texas. Uh, one of the reasons that we've not had uh, any problems is because uh, unlike a year ago when we had snowmageddon, uh, we have much greater uh, availability of wind power. And so uh, increased wind power has made uh, possible, has overcome any uh, problems with transmission of natural gas, which is very important in Texas for heating uh, and lighting. So we should look at environmental uh, improvements, at uh, products that uh, will reduce uh, environmental costs, that will help uh, deal with uh, climate change. A very important, a critical part of industrial policy will be uh, at least uh, probably at this point, ameliorating or reducing the effects of climate change, uh, which are already in effect. Maybe the best we can do right now is is reduce it. If uh, since the possibilities of reversing climate change don't seem to be very very strong, we also need to look at industrial policy in a very very broad way. It is not only what the United States is uh, willing to do, but it's what we're willing to do with other. Uh, countries. Uh, the, the Economist, uh, the great uh, British uh, publication, which is very much a pro-American publication since it uh, began publication in 1841, it's been very pro-American, which has put it at odds with many people in Britain. But The Economist uh, wrote recently that one of the effects of this uh, battle between the United States and uh, China over uh, dumping and licensing requirements and other um, uh, trade issues has been that the United States has looked to other countries like Canada and Mexico and South Korea as countries that uh, provide us uh, particularly with uh, parts for uh, computers. And this is, this is the, 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 one of the most important areas and the, one of the major supply chain problems we've had is getting the chips to go into computers that do everything uh, uh, for us. And uh, the fact that the United States has been willing to look at other countries uh, uh, besides China uh, has, had, uh, has, has increased the awareness that Yes, it is great to have one major supplier with which you can negotiate particular terms and maybe get lower terms, uh, lower uh, uh, cost. But in the long run, maybe it's uh, better to encourage, uh, just as the old, uh, the old tariff policy was, uh, uh, a tariff idea of uh, Hamilton uh, is to encourage uh, relations with other countries, which uh, might uh, your your cost, your per unit cost, may be a little higher in dealing with them. But on, in the long run, they're more dependable. They won't cut you off. Uh, it's it's less likely that the uh, Canadians or the Mexicans are going to cut off uh, supplying as China has and has threatened. Uh, to do so. So uh, we, this all goes back to the old supply chain uh, problems we talked about. Uh, that was one of our topics last year, certainly, uh, certainly uh, still with us. So we have to look for more uh, balanced uh, approaches. We have to uh, look not just at uh, what our particular interests are, uh, but what uh, the interests are of other uh, countries who can provide uh, goods and uh, services uh, to us. Uh, the idea of buying American is, uh, is, is pretty well uh, gone away. 
Uh, if you look at, <laughs> I did an inventory because I have nothing better to do with my time. I did an inventory of my closet uh, last year. None of my clothes, uh, shirts or pants come from the United States. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, um, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, uh, all these countries are far ahead of uh, our, our, our major textile manufacturing countries. Well, we were once a major textile manufacturing company, but that's a very labor intensive <clears throat> uh, business. And you cannot grow an economy like ours just relying on textiles. So you have to be able to work with other countries <clears throat> to encourage uh, flows into your own economy to satisfy your needs and also uh, again uh, the, the more countries uh, with which uh, we trade or the more countries with which uh, we deal fairly in trade uh, the less likely it is we will go into conflicts with them. This is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed but it is something that is uh, a, a an approach which uh, uh, should be uh, considered. So in summary, we do have an industrial policy. Uh, every ad advanced uh, nation, and even uh, uh, no matter what the era in which they existed, has had some type of industrial uh, policy. What is important is that industrial policy be balanced, it be coherent, and it'd be a policy that can incorporate all of uh, the major parts of uh, a nation's uh, society. Uh, it's uh, industry, uh, it's uh, government, it's uh, labor unions, it's educational institutions. Everything should be pulled in in order to create a, an equitable a, a system which will generate GDP and will protect the environment and will protect uh, human freedoms. Now, if you have a question, please feel free to come to the microphone so we can get you on, on tape. Thank you. As usual, I've answered all the, solved all your problems and answered all the questions. There we go. Thank you. Yes, sir. How is transportation affected overall? Excellent, very uh, excellent question. Um, this is one of the areas in which um, we have found very strangely that it, there are many products that it is easier for us to import from China, from the People's Republic of China. That is for us because the transportation costs are actually less than if the product was manufactured in the United States and then, and then shipped. Now this is, this is bizarre, but, but in, in fact that is the case. Now this is a, a situation in which, it, it, the, let me also talk about industrial base. There's an old adage in economics that, <clears throat> excuse me, and this will touch on this question. There's an old adage in developmental economics that the Japanese learn from the mistakes of the United States after World War II. And then the uh, uh, South Koreans learn from the mistakes of the Japanese. And then the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China, Taiwan, learn from the mistakes of the Koreans. And then Singapore learned from their mistakes, and now Vietnam is learning from their mistakes. So there's been this whole gradual uh, flow of, of knowledge. The United States, after World War II, had a big but very old industrial base. And as historians of uh, Japan after World War II have said, have written, the best thing the United States did for Japan was the 5th and 20th Air Forces, Army Air Forces, which leveled their industrial uh, base. And their industrial base then had to come back brand new. They had, they had, to have the latest, uh, latest um, 
technology. We did not, and, and as a consequence, we got caught in the 70s because Japan had come back. So, to go back to your question about transportation, what we have to look at is um, so much of uh, inventory uh, and, and tra uh, inventory and transportation are intimately connected. The idea in oh, the last 20 years or so has been that uh, you only order when you uh, absolutely, you, you don't maintain inventory, this reduce, reduces stock requirements and supervision. Uh, we, we probably need to rethink that because this uh, uh, supply chain problems, which are di diminishing, uh, but are still uh, very clear, and this is one of the reasons we've had increased inflation, uh, still need to be uh, addressed. And that goes back to if we continue to have conflicts with the uh, People's Republic of China, with mainland China, uh, maybe we should look at um, in, in, in going back to even ideas like the interstate, uh, big ideas, like the interstate highway system of 1956, President Eisenhower's probably greatest achievement uh, as president. We need to look at big, projects in order uh, to make uh, production in this country or in uh, Canada or Mexico uh, more convenient and cost effective. So, Are yes, sir. Inconsistencies of American policy uh, from, one, from one administration to another, do they result in the final analysis in an American version of mumbling through yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, President Carter, for instance, in the, his uh, term in office, uh, laid out uh, mainly through um, uh, uh, the Treasury Department a very clear industrial policy, and that was uh, increased uh, 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 for, uh, renewable energy sources, um, uh, emphasis on uh, government uh, uh, supporting uh, research and development of um, uh, new uh, technologies. Uh, and then uh, President Reagan came into office and uh, the Reagan, uh, Reaganomics uh, rejected uh, this idea because it said that this is a government planning. And government planning uh, was considered to be uh, uh, wasteful. The problem with our system is that we tend to wait until there's a crisis before we deal with it. I mean, the Snowmageddon last uh, year is a good example of that. We have to, 264 people have to die before we realize we've got a, a problem with our uh, energy uh, delivery system uh, in this uh, very advanced, uh, supposedly advanced state. So the, the, uh, the alternative to muddling through is trying to anticipate uh, crises, but um, there is a part of, uh, b because we have a diver, we, we do not have the advantage of even a system like the Republic of Korea, which is a democratic nation, uh, has a much more centralized uh, economic uh, system and a much more centralized uh, political system. So in order for us to really, uh, we, we don't want to go necessarily in that direction, but we have to find ways to get everyone uh, cooperating and playing nice on the playground uh, between the various sectors of our economy. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we lose position, we lose a, a, a position in the world. And there is something to be said for the United States maintaining a, uh, being a strong economic uh, position because that gives us the leverage to implement what we still consider to be our ide political ideals uh, in the world. Thank you. Good question. Uh, Dr. Cree. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, my question is about uh, uh, you talked about the divide between uh, you know, a free trade approach versus a mercantilist approach. And I'd like to make a parallel between, as many have, the current situation, economic rivalry between the United States and China, and the 19th century rivalry between Prussia and Germany and Great Britain. So Great Britain in the 19th century had free trade, you know, they believed it to the level almost of a religious dogma. 
Uh, it was sacred to them. Uh, then Germany, by 1890, passed uh, industrially and economically passed Britain by. And I want you to talk about the debate in Britain over whether they should maybe more affirmative industrial policy, abandon free trade, modify it, which strikes me as similar to the current debate on industrial policy in the United States. A uh, very good question. Uh, as the French say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And we do, we can learn things uh, from, uh, from, uh, from history. Uh, it's not, uh, again, quote one of my favorite presidents, Harry Truman, history is more than just one damn thing after another. Uh, what we can see from the, uh, as Dr. Green points out, the conflict between the British system and uh, the German uh, system uh, was that uh, they both worked uh, to, to, some, to some degree, except that by the time of World War I, 1914, uh, Germany's economy uh, had grown, uh, uh, was much bigger uh, than uh, the British economy. And uh, Germany and the United States, I think, were one and two. The United States actually had the biggest economy in terms of gross domestic product of any uh, major. Germany was second, and then I believe uh, the United Kingdom was third, and then uh, uh, France uh, uh, came, was uh, fourth at that time. But what this tells us is that uh, you have to have, uh, even though the, um, uh, they were competing and very, uh, they were using different um, uh, systems uh, to attain their goals, uh, the British system being more free trade, as Dr. Green says, uh, uh, and the Prussian German system uh, being more uh, neo mercantilist or uh, uh, central planning uh, kind of system. What you have to do is adapt. Uh, the, the, the difference was by the 1890s, uh, Germany was um, uh, and had become uh, an empire. It had, a, it had a type of democratic uh, system. It had a, uh, a parliament, uh, but the parliament uh, had uh, very, little, uh, very little power. The British uh, were increasingly a democratic country. More and more people got the right to vote by the 1890s. You had a more uh, egalitarian uh, system. Uh, and uh, you had a system in which uh, people uh, felt that they could, uh, v they could not only vote, but they could uh, participate in the system. So if we, uh, whatever kind of industrial policy we develop is going to have to be different than what you have in China. Uh, China has, um, a, a, a China is, uh, I want to uh, point this out. China has uh, a, a system called the Belt and Road uh, system, which is now being extended to sea lanes. The idea is to reestablish the Silk Road, uh, which made uh, China uh, very wealthy uh, because it opened trade in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s uh, with Europe. That's why we get Marco Polo's uh, great uh, travel log. And, uh, but the uh, Chinese system is very different. It's very centralized. It's a, China has a mixed economy, but it has, a, as the United States does, but it has a very centralized, it has a one party governmental system. And that one party system is not going to change anytime soon. Xi Jinping is not going to give up and decide to hold uh, free, uh, free elections. So we have to be able uh, to um, deal with, we have to be able to come up with an industrial policy which can compete with a centralized system, but which also, uh, there, there are many questions about this belt and road and sea lane uh, uh, projects. Uh, if it, it may create a lot of uh, highways to nowhere, to use a phrase from a, pre, a fairly recent presidential uh, election. Uh, it uh, may uh, result 
uh, it, it may result in uh, China uh, influencing uh, countries uh, and influencing the way that they run their governments. Uh, we let's let's face it. We have we promote a particular view of government, uh, but the way that we do it uh, uh, is backed up by economic uh, power. Uh, China can do the can do the same thing. So, are we going to go into uh, are we going to go into Africa? Are we going to offer? Are we going to go into South America, into Latin America, and um, offer the kind of um, uh, program, uh, the, the kind of economic relationship that China is talking about doing? Uh, can we do that and uh, maintain uh, maintain uh, our uh, uh, status as a democratic uh, democratic nation? I think I think we can, and of course China is our our major rival. Would you uh, favor or uh, condemn uh, the United States insisting that the companies that are doing business in China leave? That's a very good uh, question. These are all excellent questions. I would go back to um, the example of South Africa, uh, the Republic of South Africa, and the apartheid government in South Africa. The United States, and I've no, just th been thinking about this because of the recent death of uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. The United States approach uh, was to, was carrot and stick. And we would, uh, with, with South Africa, uh, we did a lot of trade uh, with South Africa, but at various points we would impose sanctions. And according to the the, the people on the inside, uh, it was the it was this carrot and stick approach uh, that uh, eventually forced uh, the apartheid government to uh, be to be dissolved and a majority government uh, to be uh, created. Uh, I think there is still much that uh, can be um, achieved by American companies uh, sending, uh, sending Americans or hiring Chinese, uh, using American approaches uh, uh, to, promote, uh, uh, to promote what we consider to be democratic uh, ideals. I don't think that we should cut off. Well, first of all, it, it, uh, we need China and China needs us. China needs our debt. Uh, China's, uh, China's the biggest purchaser of uh, U.S. Treasuries uh, because that's the safest uh, investment in the world. Uh, but we should also be willing to, to uh, the Chinese are uh, remarkably sensitive and anything that we do, no matter how seemingly minor, like saying, uh, the president said we won't send any diplomatic representatives to the Winter Olympics. Well, that's just, you know, so, so what? You know, some, some airlines don't get as many uh, tickets sold. But that had an extraordinary effect on China. China is very sensitive to that kind of slight. And part of that goes back to China's relationship with the West. Uh, the two wars you've never heard of are the Opium Wars of the 1840s. If you're in China, you know everything about that because that's the West trying to destroy, that's how they're trying to destroy China and that's how they're trying to destroy us today. So I think we can do the carrot and stick approach. Now, South Africa is very different. Uh, just changing a government, uh, even in a country as large as South Africa, was relatively simple in comparison to the long-term effects in China. But China needs us, we need China, and uh, we can uh, promote what we still think are our founding uh, principles. But we have to do it, uh, we, we can't just cut off trade, but we can do things which will make it clear that, no, you can't keep doing, uh, doing uh, what you're doing, uh, uh, in, in, uh, like with the Muslims in Western China, 
uh, uh, the, the treatment of uh, uh, dissidents uh, in China, the democratic uh, uh, advocates in China, or particularly in, in Hong Kong. So I would say, Kit, I think, I think we, I don't think we should reject it. What, what do we get from China that we really have to have? Have you looked in your, in your, <laughs> I, I, I was just thinking about my, I, I do the, I do the, I, I'm sorry. I, I do the dishes at home, and I do the laundry. And so, I, I, again, I have nothing better to do with my time. So I always look on the back of plates and cups. They're all made in China. All my shoes are, are made in China. Yeah. So we like... Couldn't they be made somewhere else? They could be, and this is where... Like the Philippines. The Philippines, this is where, a very good point. This is where uh, countries like Vietnam, suddenly we're good friends with the Vietnamese. Who would have believed that in the 1960s? The Vietnamese, the Filipinos, the uh, Singapore, um, uh, even, uh, even countries like um, uh, Thailand, uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh has the fastest growing economy in the world. This was a country that 50 years ago was achieved ind independence and they would had the most unbelievable, horrifying poverty. Well, now they have a very a rapidly growing uh, economy uh, and it's mainly from textiles. They've taken over textiles from Vietnam. Well, Vietnam is now manufacturing steel. They've taken that over from South Korea and they took that over from Mexico and Mexico took it over from the United States. So. Uh, we could, uh, one of the reasons, uh, uh, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, uh, went to Southeast Asia, went to uh, Australia recently, not because he wants to enjoy a little vacation down there, but for, uh, to promote a relationship with those countries. And yes, uh, with uh, countries like Vietnam, we could, uh, and with countries like Vietnam, we can, we've already made strides in terms of religious freedom, uh, uh, by th simply through uh, industrial uh, power. So, good point. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes, sir. What do you think of the um, theory that um, there is a competitive advantage to cultures and that the Asians do well because they're very detail oriented, the Germans do well because they love science and they're disciplined? Uh, and the Anglo-Saxons, Americans first, and our British cousins are meddling. Uh, you know, and there's something to be said for meddling. It's, you know, let fate do what it will. Uh, there's something to be said for cultural um, differences. I think there are, um, uh, my family, uh, I'm, I'm, about 50% Scottish, 25% English, and 25% uh, German. But my great-grandmother, Clownberg, German is such a lovely language. Uh, my great-grandmother, -gra great Clownberg, uh, was born in the United States, but her parents were born in Germany. And in 1917, when the United States went to war, her family asked her, jokingly, uh, grandmother, if uh, a German uh, airplane landed at Fayetteville Airport in Fayetteville, Arkansas, what would you do? And she said, I would take them a copy of my German Bible and cookies and milk. And she meant it. She was, I mean, her heart was still back in the, in the home country. And uh, so these, I think cultural, there's something uh, to be said, again, using um, that one industrial policy doesn't fit all. And what uh, can work in one place does not necessarily work uh, every place. So you have to take that into, that into consideration. Uh, because uh, this idea, this, this comes from Marxian thinking. The Marxian thinking was that, uh, that humans are economic animals. And I think we're more were more than that. And, and also, uh, I think that even the, the Marxian idea of the economic animal was that all humans are the same. Well, there's certain things that we all held in common, uh, but 
uh, our cultural and uh, differences uh, can be used, uh, should be recognized in uh, carrying out any kind of uh, political or economic policy. Thank you. Very good nice. question. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. For, uh, Thank you. Stein, a uh, wonderful presentation. And I uh, hope you will all join us uh, next Wednesday uh, on January 12th, where yours truly, I will be presenting on the Quad Alliance, uh, which is the United States, Japan, India, and Australia trying to contain an expansionist People's Republic of China. So I hope to join you then. And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, until next Wednesday, uh, uh, see you later. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.